Leonard Budachi has been here before. He's not a stranger to the Situation Room, but another hot topic coming from the hot seat. Leonard, good morning. Good morning to you, Ndu. Companies are folding. We have a long list of those companies that yeah, are folding. they are. They are. Uh, tough uh, times. Tough times. And yeah. there's been some madness. And so we're going to look into the whys. And yep. as CT would say, the where to falls of all of this and see uh, <laughs> exactly what the issue is. Indeed. And small businesses, big businesses, medium-sized business, businesses, everybody's affected. And something is causing that. And we want to find out why. Leonard Mudachi is the... Uh, chair, chairman, rather, of the Retail Traders Association of Kenya. And you speak today in that capacity. So, before we get into it and then cry for me, my beloved country, yeah. CT will welcome us with today's proverb from Malawi. <laughs> A piece of incense may be as large as the knee, but unless burnt, emits no fragrance. <laughs> wow. Leonard? What do you think about that? What does that mean to you? Um, I think for me, I, I'll take it from the perspective of um, it, it's it's the it's it's more quality rather than quantity, in hmm. the sense that it's not uh, how much you do, but how effective you are in what you do. You may do a little and have great impact. And you may do a lot, and I think the log in this case, a uh, fragrance log <laughs> that has no smell, is mm -hmm. an example of doing a lot and um, not having an impact really. And you maybe have a small piece of sandalwood, and you burn it, and it has great fragrance and impact in in the room. If you if you're trying to get a good smell in a room, city is impressed by your fragrance knowledge. <laughs> Mm. He, he was at. He stopped at sandalwood. <laughs> yeah, by the time someone gets to sandalwood, <laughs> as you say, touche. Touche. What I mean. <laughs> wow, I'm impressed too. Wow. Okay, so I didn't see it going that way, but all right, we'll take it. Um, so I'm just looking at some headlines, Leonard. Yes. Um, as we get into this conversation, um, looking at some headlines, and they've made their way, and it didn't start in. September 2023, we saw from a year ago where the big f um, financial firms around the world started to give, you know, warning signals. And they mm -hmm. said, there's something going on here. Mm -hmm. And we started to see indications that uh, businesses in this part of the world were then starting to shut down. Of course, we know the COVID effect. There was the COVID effect, and we knew that because of the type of certain businesses, they had to shut down immediately because, you know, there was no congregation of persons things like that did not take place but th what we are seeing now is something more it's a little bit more than because a world a global phenomenon has asked you to stop doing business but there's something else that's going on and we've seen the folding of very many firms in kenya there's a list even that has come out there was a list that came out last year and i guess the overarching question right now is what on earth is going on um like you're right in saying that um this started globally i don't mm. think we're isolated i mm. think we have we have if we're to look at the last um three to four years they they have been uh, events of a lifetime mm. and um but but let's go back a bit and and uh, interrogate uh, capital or where does money come from for businesses mm. and maybe we can start with the states um which from uh, in Kenya, a lot of the companies that we have seen uh, closed down have been fintechs, you know, yep. or e-commerce firms. Um, and we can trace that back to where money comes from. So um, we, we, there was a season in the States where, uh, let's call money, look, let's look at money as a commodity. And it is in a lot of, in, in, in most cases, there was very cheap money available in the states mm -hmm. um so um if you understand how um private equity works or venture capital they don't have their own money you know they get their money from uh, pension funds or um other large holders of capital who give them money to go ahead and invest in this money in these various businesses right now that is fine when um they have nowhere else to put that money and make a healthy return. 
So they, let's let's just for conversation sake take a, an example and say okay, um, I'm a large pension fund from the states. Let's say the 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 uh, the, the police department pension fund and mm -hmm. I have X billion dollars and yeah. I give it to fund X to manage and fund X tells me we'll give you a return of uh, 7% yeah so I'm like okay mm -hmm. um, at that time when there was cheap money in the states the market or the, or the US treasuries were giving what 0.5 or 1% so you look at that 7 and you look at that 1 and you're like okay uh, this one is higher risk but I'll take it because it gives me a greater return. So we had a decade or so uh, where um, a lot of companies came up with a model where uh, sustainability and profitability was not the initial goal. You know, that the goal was scale. Mm. Now that's great because there was cheap money. So people are saying, fine, uh, show us that you're continuing to grow even before you're profitable. We're fine with that because we can see the growth. Um, and then things changed, or, or rug the rug was pulled right. from under them, and you now see. I think today the U.S. Treasury bills are sitting at maybe seven, if not eight percent. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, when you look at it from that perspective, I have the same pension funds. Why would I put my money in high risk uh, PE or venture capital at the expense? of uh, and there's treasury bills which is very low risk money mm -hmm. i just put it my money there and get my eight percent now why does that come back to uh, that should affect the states and we saw everyone we saw google we saw facebook we saw everyone uh, laying off people so why did it come to affect us now we come to where does the money that was funding the fintechs come from it comes from the very uh, uh, PEs, private equity firms and venture capitalists that were getting that cheap money in the states. Mm. So overnight you had companies which had been told grow, grow, grow says oh we're not yet profitable, it's okay grow, we want you to have a larger footprint, spread yourself go and overnight it's like where's the profitability? Mm. <laughs> and uh, because he who he who pays the piper calls the tune. Calls the tune. So mm. um, they come and, and uh, that is a dramatic, it may not be the only reason, mm. yeah, but it is a big reason. So companies who had gone, you hear them talk about Series A, Series B, uh, companies who are in funding rounds mm. uh, found the funding market a bit dire you know, in comparison to previous years, mm -hmm. when they would go and set their targets for fundraising, which were informed by their business plans, mm -hmm. and um, they would then go out and get their money. Okay. I hear what you're saying. Mm -hmm. But let's look at, the, there was a case that has been made, or rather put out, for these Kenyan eight firms and a ninth one on the way, who for some reason still folded even with this huge funding that they had been given, we're mm -hmm. talking about 35 billion shillings mm -hmm. across eight of them. Are we looking at them folding? And when we talk about folding, they've closed shop. Mm -hmm. Everything shut down. We're going, we're done. Mm -hmm. Right? They received this money. So are you saying that in the blink of an eye, where the money came from, there is an ask as per profitability. You've given you this money. Show us what you're doing with it. And with an inability to produce profit or to at least give an explanation why, what are we saying happened? That but this money was pulled out? No, we're saying mm. that uh, there was a shift in the um, needs and wants of the funder. Mm -hmm. So the funder originally was chasing growth. Mm -hmm. And the business plans for those businesses were built around growth. And you are told, go and grow. Yeah, and growth and profitability are not the same thing. No, you can say okay. Um, let's let's take an example of Uber. You know, Uber is um, I'm not up to date for this year, but is not a profitable company. Yeah, mm. but they have a system that is growth based. Mm. It says we'll build a footprint. Yeah, go into as many countries as you can. Eventually, when you own the ecosystem or you have grown to a certain level, mm. the profitability will come. Mm. Yeah, so a lot of that happened in Kenya. 
It was like, we'll make money on scale. So the first priority is not growth. If you are to prioritize the list, let's say we're saying profitability, and then after profitability, scale. But this one was flipped, and we're told, okay, first we want you to grow. So you had companies which are maybe, let's say, Nairobi-based only, yeah, and uh, were earmarked to go to, um, maybe to be profitable in the next six months, mm -hmm. yeah. But in the six months, you're told, no, 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 go to, go to Mombasa. And you go to Mombasa, you have not, you're not yet making money in Nairobi. So now you have Nairobi expenses plus Mombasa expenses. And when you start to gain a foothold in Mombasa, you're told, oh, let's go to Nakuru. So that we can show our potential funders in the future mm -hmm. that we are big. You know, because let's also not forget that we're a relatively small market as Kenya. So to show the kind of scale that the global funders would be interested in, you have to be small by their standard is, is probably medium right. by ours. Yeah. So they want you to scale to a level where you say, this is the potential we're showing you. So look, give us money because we are already on this path. Look what we did in Nairobi. Look what we did in Mombasa. Look what we're doing in Nakuru. So give us money to cover the whole of Kenya. Yeah. Now imagine if that's you and you're, you're running that business. So you have staff to mm -hmm. go to Mombasa, to Nakuru. You have staff to, to push this growth model. Yeah. And overnight it changes to um, you need to be making money. Mm -hmm. So what are you going to do? You're either going to start cutting back Unfortunately, we had some that tried their level best but ended up cutting back completely, which is sh shutting down. Mm -hmm. But you also have many others who just shut down markets and say, okay, we are closing down this market, we are closing down this market, and we are remaining with this, all in an attempt to, 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 to get that profitability. Mm -hmm. And so it's an overnight, not an overnight, but it's a, it's a shift in um, strategy resulting from a change in 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 the funding environment in what the funder wants mm. yeah and the funder and maybe that's where we should uh, we should segue into that and say okay can we have more local funders you know so that uh, some of these decisions are more local do we have i think history? we do do we have a culture that encourages the very thing that you're saying um, i think we need it to emerge we need it to um, emerge because we can't continue. A lot has changed, you know. Um, we 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 used to dial rotary phones, you know, and now we we are comfortable with phones in our hands and 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 we use them as we go. So I think we can change. Um, and I I feel that um, our potential funders, if we are to borrow from the other markets. There are a lot of interesting things happening in the market and we hope that they'll continue and grow. Um, but we need um, our capital, our local capital. Mm. Is that not what a lot of these funders that we're talking about today? Because as you said, a lot of the funding then is US, it's stateside. Uh, it comes from uh, U some European countries, but they, ha they can be investors because the original base of their capital was from profits that they made while being emerged in their local markets. So mm -hmm. there are two things here. You talked about the fact that why we have to, as uh, local businesses, as Kenyan businesses or African businesses in other countries, why we have to secure this foreign funding or this external funding is because it's going to take time for your local consumer to rack up enough for you that you can use now as exchange for your business that there's not enough for you to buy and sell or to use services or that the culture of promoting such businesses has not gotten to the point where businesses can remain afloat without funding right okay is that what we're saying but if you look at these funders who are external the truth of the matter is that they built up their base of capital because of the fact that there was that exchange at a local level that people within their communities were buying their goods and commodities. They were exploring their services and that's how they were able to have a surplus because you're not funding anybody if you don't have a surplus. Is that not the truth? You're yeah, not investing in something. You're not taking a loan to invest fair for enough. somebody else. Fair enough. But I think you need to, we need to explore who the funder is. Right. 
um, and a lot of the funders or the large capital holders mm. are not necessarily corporate entities. Mm. They may not be for profit. In fact, in a lot of cases, they are not for for profit. Mm. Um, they they may be funds that are set up uh, specifically to manage that. But where are these funds getting their money from? Exactly. Maybe pension funds. Mm -hmm. We in Kenya have a phenomenal pension environment. Yeah, if you're to <laughs> if you're to if you're to look at uh, I like look at the Nairobi skyscraper landscape. You know oh. when it, now you get very nice silhouettes of Nairobi mm. and and just count how many of them. Do your research and find out how many of them are owned by local pension funds. Yeah, mm. our pension funds do have. Last time I checked, in the region of maybe twelve to thirteen billion dollars of funds under management. So this is a lot of money <laughs> that we are talking about and. What I'm saying is that no, not that we do not want the foreign funds, mm. yeah, but I think as locals, we also need to look at other ways that we can get involved in, in, in funding local entities for two reasons. Mm. Uh, reason number one is, of course, what we said. Um, you understand the local market better and you understand its shocks and uh, ebbs and flows better. And you as an investor would not be making a demand on whomever you gave. If we're talking about local funds, pooling of resources mm -hmm. here, because you understand the market, what we're saying is that there would not be a demand on your grantee or fundee, whatever that is, uh, the benefactor of these funds. You would not be making demands on them for growth immediately because you understand what the market is like is that what we're saying you would be making more more locally contextual demands mm. because you how you would have a better understanding of the local market you would not be trying to turn kenya into a microcosm of what for example silicon valley is doing mm. you know or push growth metrics that are not in line with that because we take for granted that our ecosystem is also emerging there's a lot of learning that's going on yeah and we are getting better in, at this than we were in the past. And that brings me to the other big issue, I think, is local context. Mm -hmm. I think uh, we need to have the conversation about how do local, um, local founders attract capital. It's not always the case. And sometimes you, you do have some examples of entities which come into the market. Nothing against uh, foreign direct investment, but I think we have not been good at valuing local intellect. Mm -hmm. And local intellect has value. You do have some, some, some um, concepts. Actually, one of the companies that is mentioned on that list mm -hmm. is in the food space, which I'm in. Mm -hmm. And when they got the funding that they got, a lot of us local players were like, what? How? How? You know, um, and you don't want to pour cold water on someone's idea, particularly because they've gotten funding. But you have to question who gave you money mm. on the concept and that why? if yeah. you apply local norms and local nuances to it, does not hold water, you know, for simple facts. So um, I think local context is a big thing and it does have a value and it should be valued. And I think... Local players, even the international players who come in and fund, need to pre place a greater premium on local context and understanding on, lo on local nuances. I mean, we had a, a, a C, C, uh, famed Kenyan telco CEO who said, what about Kenyans and their pe peculiar, peculiar, habits. peculiar habits? Those peculiar habits um, are, are local context. Mm. And when you tell me that you're going to do this in this way, um, I may tell you something very small, uh, but that, what I'm telling you, has value and could mean success or failure of the venture. But I would have assumed, again, I shouldn't, but I would have assumed that uh, people who have money to invest would be people who will go out of their way, go to great lengths, to ensure that due diligence is done before they put their money. And I would mm -hmm. assume that this local context and then content that you speak of would be one of their considerations. Agreed. Uh, but um, I like to, to use this example because it's a good example. Yeah. Go, go and uh, um, uh, look in LinkedIn, yeah? which is now your primary source of looking at talent you mm. know, or, or uh, experience and look for Africa expert. Mm. Yeah. And then on the same note, go and look for 
European or, 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 or American or Asian expert, mm. you know. Chances are you will not see many, uh, even though we have uh, Kenyans in the diaspora who have been there for, for 30, 40 years or maybe even longer. Um, and a lot of other Africans, you'll not see themselves touting themselves as European experts mm. on their CVs, <laughs> uh, and 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 that be <laughs> that be a foundation for getting funding, you know. But, but you see a whole load of African experts, and are they really? I think we we're, we're, we're getting to a point. <laughs> we're getting to a point in the local market where we are owning our narrative better. Mm. And as a result... Or at the very basic minimum, owning our narrative. We're owning we're our not narrative, doing it yeah. And so yeah. that needs to translate into, into the whole capital discussion. Mm. Yeah. You know, the question about funding and business, look at the prevailing social ecosystem that these funds come from mm. look at how it is they understand money look at how it is they understand the application of it and look at how it is they understand the growth of it mm. and the willingness to actually venture the willingness to actually be entrepreneurs in the real sense of the word and to take risks our environment here i see a lot of risk averse very very risk averse people Mm -hmm. Because if, if if I look, for instance, at the banking sector, mm. and do you are going to say my favorite topic? Of course. Yes, it is. Mm. My favorite topic is they are so risk averse that if you use the word growth and the word entrepreneurship in the same sentence with many of our local banks, mm. what you'd be trying to prove are complete opposites. Because one doesn't quite support anything that they may refer to as a partnership is something that is absolutely removed of any possible known risk and unfortunately in business you can't do that you'll go up to a certain point and then you talk about the money that we have in the pension uh, sphere mm. it is a ton of money but who benefits from it so you raise a very interesting topic in in the sense that where is our money invested mm. yes and who so, yes, there is a risk aversion. Um, and you see something like real estate in Kenya. Mm. is something that people love. They you know? do. So, people love land. I'm going to buy a quarter. I'm going to buy an eighth. Mm. And I'm not here to, to chastise that. It's great. Uh, many can show a healthy return that they have made for that. But I'm saying that there are other forms of investment. And it's also good to see that, for example, we have a very vibrant stock exchange. Mm. Yeah. And um, at Retrack, we had a meeting with the, uh, the NSC and we had a conversations around the things, the new things they are looking at in terms of how to raise capital. And it's exciting to see those conversations to, uh, being had. But you talked about uh, entrepreneurship and failure. I think if I'm to bring back this conversation about a uh, local context, yes, there's risk and yes, our, our financiers, mainly our commercial banks, tend to be very risk averse. Yeah? But I think, again, we, ha as we still fail to place the value on that knowledge. If I'm to invest in the business, I'd rather find someone who's tried and failed once or twice. Right. Mm. Because I know what he has learned is priceless. And you cannot teach those lessons in a classroom. Mm. The pain, the emotional turmoil of going through that and what he, he knows. But I also feel that one of the challenges a lot of local entrepreneurs face is adequate capital. You don't get people with the ability, given the ability or the chance, to execute without the constraints of capital. Mm. So you find that a lot of businesses bootstrap or, or in... in, in in uh, capital raising speak, bootstrapping is, is, is basically running your, your company on the bare minimum until you on get the, it to on, stand, yeah. on stand shoes, up on a, yeah. on a shoestring shoe budget. budget. Yeah. But you find a lot of companies in Kenya uh, or a lot of younger entrepreneurs being forced to bootstrap for way longer than is, is, is normal. It's normal. I'd like us to look into that a little bit more because um, this conversation about why so many startups are folding 
and we can say so many even if the list is nine even mm. if the list is two mm. even if the list is 20 we can say so many because if we're looking at the amount of money that has been pushed into these organizations by funders the amount of money that has been put in by the owners themselves the blood sweat and tears that have gone in it's too many when one folds and the reasons that they're giving many could argue are things that could have been avoided or sorted out in the moment where there was a call for help as we went to the break we were talking about okay so some of the things they complain about the external funding issue aside some of them on this list mention you know a a difficult business environment and they didn't know this before they got in, into that business environment this is the question i want to ask that we already know that it would be oh. difficult here and there mm -hmm. taxes are high cost of compliance is high um those things now make it difficult for you to jostle and then at the same time we know already it's been told to us that the number one issue for smes and msmes on the continent is access to credit that's the number one challenge, bottleneck for everybody. doesn't matter where you are. So how can these challenges be overcome if you want to have vibrant and viable business in the country, in anywhere? No. Most of the people who have the money, most of the institutions who have the money are not business people. They don't think. They're bureaucrats. The people who have the money, the people who own the business. No, the people who are in charge of it. The people who are at the helm, where you are, can find these monies that you're talking about. Mm. They're not the holders people. of capital. Yes, they, they, they're, they're not business people. Um, I think I, I'll keep coming back to, to, to local context. Mm. I think we have to give local entrepreneurs and local entities yeah, mm -hmm. the value, and I call it non-capital value. You know, when you're looking at what you bring to a business, you don't just bring money. Otherwise, you'd have just left the money there and you would have multiplied, you know. But you, you, you're you investing in something. Now, that something has a value. Now, where are we going to... What you talk about is the lack of adequate capitalization. You know, there are some basic things a business needs to do to take off. Yep. Yeah. Now, most don't start with even those basic things. They are starting from far below. So instead of focusing on fixing the problem that they saw in setting up the business and getting to a certain point where they see success or failure, they are focused on survival from day one, mm -hmm. you know, um, and that would not be the case if they are adequately funded. And I'm not sitting here saying that if you throw money at a problem, it disappears because we all know that not to be true. Mm -hmm. But what I'm saying is that take whether it's going to be a pilot, you know, take some of these young entrepreneurial businesses, fund them adequately, set up controls and measures to monitor that funding and let them be. Because a lot of these businesses were not executing models mm -hmm. that um, the founders or the local founders were um, entirely taken to. You know, some of them were executing, had models tweaked to, to, to meet the requirements of the funders, you know? So my, my plea for more local funding, and uh, I'm glad to say that you can begin to see it coming through. Uh, we hope we can see more of it in the next decade. But is because I think we will build much more um, sustainable uh, local businesses if those that are funding, one, are local and uh, can see the nuances, but even if they're international, if they respect and give due credence to a uh, local context. Um, Nairobi is not a microcosm of, of the Silicon Valley. It's mm -hmm. Nairobi. Mm -hmm. The nuances of how the Nairobi consumer behaves and how he consumes are different, you know, even though you're consuming the same thing, you know. So can we give that its proper place in the whole capital discussion. Does it tell or does it give a foreboding um, atmosphere around the business environment in the country if we see this happening in 2023? We're not talking about something that happened 10 years ago. We're talking, we're saying that businesses fold and businesses folded in this the last year. six months. Yeah. This year. 
So for those who, and we also know that it's been touted, entrepreneurship is one of the uh, factors of development. When you see that now individuals or groups of people then now have the might and muscle to come together and form businesses whereby they can provide you know, goods and services to the general population for which it will be exchanged for money, you start to grow and mushrooming development takes place, right? We know that. But if the environment is showing that it's hostile, at whatever level, external, internal, with government, wherever, how does that then foster growth when you say, again, entrepreneurship and the development of business is a factor for development? And we can see that the environment does not provide that uh, atmosphere that is necessary for that to grow. Who are these people who are going to come tomorrow after having seen eight people, eight businesses shut down and they're going to say, well, okay, I'm going to try this. Why not? I can survive. Who are those? Um, I think they're there mm. in mm. the sense that uh, sometimes opportunities show themselves in the midst of chaos. Mm -hmm. um, chaotic environments are sometimes when you see the real problems and you see what solutions you can provide. And probably the place where you make the most profits if you actually understand true. how to navigate those. Very problems. true. And we're not, we're not talking about... Um, Again, this is not a Kenyan problem. Mm. This closure of businesses has been happening internationally. Of course, this year, um, we have really seen uh, the government uh, mm. flex its muscle. And, and uh, uh, really, I would say, in, hit us where it hurts. Because we, the market is tough, but everything is going up. So that doesn't help either. But they will still be there. I, I'm sure there's someone somewhere still thinking up a solution and a business to open. You're seeing a lot of these businesses, not all of them that uh, had their funding either re rearranged or, 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 or it dried up, not all of them closed. Some of them are now trying to rethink their models and say, how do I change to see how I can work within the means that I have and, and are doing business plans that speak to that. Mm -hmm. So they'll always be. Uh, uh, people ready to come and start businesses and uh, we are in a tough we're in a tough season yes uh, but i think there still are great opportunities and the greatest i i lean to and i hope um, is kenya is a blessed nation mm -hmm. when it comes to the capacity and the intellect of what we have as a people the knowledge of different sectors is quite phenomenal um, yet, that knowledge and the capital are not quite talking, mm. or are not quite talking the same language. You know, so can we get to a place where, where they, they, are. They, they are? So then what needs to happen for them to be speaking the same language? Because somebody's here speaking this and somebody's here speaking, what, what is going to be that... Uh, communal moment when that happens but something way, needs to catalyze, to catalyze way, Lou, that doesn't it i think it's really happening if is you ask it? me yes it is mm. out of the adversity that you find the kenyans facing they find ways of ensuring they survive in that very hostile environment now it may look like a cliche but that in itself tells you that the mindset and the willingness to actually find solution exists. You can see it, even in the most dire of circumstances. Now, when you talk about made in Kenya, forget garments, forget things that we look at. Huh? I'm thinking of the mindset. How is it that Kenyans will easily say, oh, that's a Kenyan? Mm. What is it about a Kenyan that is clear? For instance, when we talked about some of these businesses that are funded by foreign entities and they go under, as a Kenyan, the first thing I asked, was that money given to a Kenyan? Mm. The, the reason why we ask that question is because we understand that if it's a Kenyan who has given that money and, it is, and the business has folded, you're not really sure whether that money was actually put to the use it was intended. You're not really sure. Now, it sounds adverse and it sounds almost negative and degrading, but it is a reality that we Kenyans understand about ourselves. I think... But but it's it, it it's a reality, but it's also a bit of a stereotype. Yes, it in, is. In the sense that no, not a bit. Yeah, it's very much a stereotype. Yes, yes. In the sense that I think some of the brilliant stories of Kenyan entrepreneurship. One of the challenges we have as a nation is that they are not heard. 
you know uh, um our tenderpreneurs are very visible and vocal and you know boisterous and they are they are in your face and, and so and they're consuming conspicuously for yes, the whole world to see so the aspirations are that that is business mm -hmm. that's not business but there are lots of kenyan businesses there are lots of kenyans running really well built businesses yes they are and uh, uh, that have even survived generations you know and are very well run and are aspiring for greater now the question is even those ones how do we connect them or how does local capital connect with them mm. so that we can start to build regional and uh, continental powerhouses but consider the you see the dominant narrative is the one i presented agreed which has a very negative tinge to it but you're right you know, as we were talking earlier, when we were talking about the food industry, I'm reminded of Kosewe. Mm. Okay? Mm. A simple concept. Look at the, the, the very humble beginnings. And how it is, it became a go-to eatery. Mm. Yes. Okay? Now, almost unbelievably so. I'm saying unbelievably so because just the numbers of people who would go there, it competed favorably with some of the best eateries that people talk about. Agreed. Now, that's local, as, as local as it gets. Sure. Mm. Okay. Yeah. In everything. Now, there are others. Mm. Now, my question is, and I'm glad you brought up Kosewe, because it's a, it's, it's, it's a brilliant Kenyan story, but it's also a sad one. Mm. Yes, because Ko Kosewe, at its prime, was phenomenal. Now, how do you take a Kosewe concept? Yeah. Now, what happened to Kosewe? If you look at Kosewe, mm. uh, ownership um, is the quest to, to uh, grow a business and make it into a big business of what it does very well? Mm. Yes. Or is the quest to make some money and then go into other things? Uh, yeah. You know, were you a food, were you a food operator From aspiring to be a landlord, mm. you know, for example, <laughs> or, 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 or a hotelier? You or a hotelier. You so you now food, starve yeah. the, 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 the goose that's laying the golden, golden egg of capital by taking out that capital to do other things. And it saddens me because I think it's an amazing, it was an amazing brand. Do you think that's what ails businesses? It is part to a, of what? To a, to a large extent. Because, it is okay, you're part doing part well, of. you're chugging along, you're mm. doing the thing, right? And you start to make some, because it is profit. You start to make some profit. Rather than take that profit and enlarge that thing that has, again, laid the egg, we see that uh, that profit is taken and you want to, of course, buy a plot, buy two, three, put up a set of apartment buildings. Would you say that the bane then of the downfall of many businesses could also be attributed to wanting to stretch this profit thin as opposed to focusing and making this worm very fat? I think we have examples of both. Mm. You have given an example of Kosewe. Yeah. But I think... Uh, Equity Bank is a phenomenal Kenyan story of capital. Mm. And in our membership, in the Retrack membership, you have lots of examples of capital well executed over a period of time to create a phenomenal brand. I mean, look at our supermarket sector. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. our supermarket sector has had its, its downs. Yes. You know, big brands collapsing. But look what's happening now. You know, Naivas, Quickmart, all local brands, well built international standards uh, on the on the spectacle fr uh, front look at optica mm. you're seeing optica everywhere mm. on the shoes front you see people like city walk you know and on on on, um, on uh, the healthy foods mm. you have brands like healthy you mm -hmm. you know on the beauty front you have brands like lintons these are all local brands that are uh, have focused you know they are not uh, uh, a supermarket aspiring to become a landlord right. or to build a block of flats, you <laughs> They're know, staying within the space. They are staying the, the space. Mm -hmm. And look at Equity Bank mm -hmm. now. You talk about a regional banking powerhouse with continental ambitions. That's that, and a, a great example of the local and international capital given to local intellect with strong local context. And look what they're built. Mm. Actually, Equity is a very good example. Yeah. Because it's so successful that it actually attracted this so-called external funding. People want to partner with you because they can see what you're doing works. Mm. With local teams. Yes. Yeah. Yes. With, with very strong, well-built local teams. Yes. And now you go 
and you're now talking about um you have other examples in the financial sector but what i'm saying is that can we appreciate that that local intellect and context has value Indeed. and begin to al unlock it so then and that's the thing that you look at the value but you know you can't just keep looking at it because all right it's nice and shiny but then you have to be able to start taking it and using it and are we saying now that even as we've seen businesses folding in you know this th the last year it doesn't necessarily mean that it's doomsday and there's no light at the end of the tunnel but that there's something that can be done moving forward and what should that be um for me i'd speak to um creating multiple options for funding whether they are local foreign it would be great to see local holders of capital jump into their free so that entrepreneurs have multiple options mm. of where they can uh, they can uh, uh, get their capital and when that happens having the ability to say that yes there's this idea yeah but this idea has respecting the element of local context that is required and intellect that is required to 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 bring that to life mm. there's so much we can do first of all um the first time i came on this show the first time i i, did, I was on this show we were discussing food yes if we had to have an honest conversation about the situation our, of our food production as a nation, the average Kenyan will be very worried. There's a huge entrepreneurial opportunity there. You have these great research brains in 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 your you know in vet services, for example. Mm. Their research is not being; they would not get the chance with the right kind of capital to execute what they know works. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, can we bridge that gap? bridge that gap between the intellect and the capital so that we can truly unlock value that uh, the country and the nation has mm. you know when we talk about local capital seeking to be adventurous there are two impediments in my in my mind one is just government and its policies and then something we refer to as crony capitalism because mm. It kills competition. Mm -hmm. One doesn't. Well, you find people walking around thinking they're businessmen and they're not, mm. because they, they, there is no value they're creating. They just know ways and means of ensuring that they're in a place where money can come to them, or they can grab at it, or they, 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 they can ensure that it gets to them. Now, why I'm saying this kills what we're talking about is it's huge amounts of money that find their way to individuals. And yet, this same amount of money, if it were in a business... In the rate, right pockets, yeah. Mm. Precisely. These very things that you hear... I think, yeah. I think you've touched on a cancer. That's mm. a cancer. Yeah. We have that. You know, and, and let me explain it to you from a retail context. Mm. Yes. So, there was a time I was working for a local restaurant chain. And we were look, seeking for space. Mm. Now, restaurant metrics say that we... We'll, this if we get a location in this place it will sell x amount and as a result you work backwards and you can see if we are able to sell this much per month then our expenses correspondingly should be this this and this now you then uh, go to a landlord and the landlord is fast he's quoting a dollar based rent he's saying he wants three dollars per square foot and you're like can't i wouldn't make money uh, on three dollars by but uh, per square foot uh, because you're running or we were running our business based on restaurant metrics but what is the landlord's response he's saying people are signing up this same space that you're complaining about yeah and saying that it doesn't make commercial sense to take it up uh, even though you want to be in this location there are people taking it up mm. now those people who are taking it up are the ones you speak about you know they are not in it they are um either wives husbands uh, mistresses uh, or, or, or <laughs> children you yeah. know uh, and they are given money and if the rent can't if the business can't pay for the rent more money will be availed and the rent will be paid so that muddies the waters yeah because then you have unrealistic rents uh, landlords feel that oh i can get this rent hmm. yeah yeah I'm, I, I am getting this rent <laughs> but who is he getting that rent from let's look at a point to continue the conversation on into the future and mm -hmm. the thing is that the environment could look hostile because in many cases it is
but that are we saying that there is a way in which you know those who will go into business those who will have startups those who will look towards communities to say we can grow this thing actually still have an opportunity to strike indeed fire indeed they do Mm. And um, like uh, I'm here, I'm, yeah. I'm going nowhere. Yeah. So I'm in this space. We'll continue to be in this space, learn from the lessons and the failures. But there are many of us in the market, yeah. And we'll continue to 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 beat this drum mm. of having this conversation about cap capital from a different uh, perspective. Mm. It's no different from the the conversation the the um, the president is having in an international context, mm. where he's saying the risk premium you 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 place on africa is unrealistic yeah yeah so we are having the same conversation in the local context and we'll continue to have it and we hope for success indeed leonard mudachi is the chairman of the kenya traders association retail traders association um of kenya and he's been our guest this hour there's light and we can act, this light we can see Thank it's you. a good thing thank you so much for being our guest this hour thank you for having me this is the situation room the only way to start your day.